We all know that pharmacology plays a big role in the NCLEX exam. Although it's true that questions pertaining to delegation, prioritization, and infection control will make up a majority of the questions, medications and drugs that correlates to particular diseases will be in itself a part of each category. Let's face it, pharmacology and medications can be the hardest part to study in the NCLEX exam, yet it's the most important concept that we need to not only know and memorize, but to also understand better. With that in mind, we can look at different productive ways that can help make us retain and understand medications in a more basic and minimalistic way. This strategy will involve simplifying medications in a way that benefits our brain and its working mechanism. First, we divide the drugs based on the system that it impacts the most. Second, we analyze on a basic level the pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics. Basically, we want to know how the drugs work and how it do what it does. Because once we understand this, it can be easier for us to conceptualize its side effects and interactions. And lastly, we need to know any important implications and interventions that needs to be applied towards the patient taking this medication. So let's begin. First, let's take a look at the cardiovascular system and the drugs that has an effect on, the car on our cardiovascular system. For this system, we need to remember the initials 3A, B, C, D, slash V. That's 3 a, B, C, D, slash, V. And if we know this by heart, then we are ready for the 95% of the cardiac drugs that we may encounter in the NCLEX. So let's begin with 3A, or what I call AAA. And it makes it easier if you can just remember AAA batteries or the AAA vehicle company. Now let's begin. For AAA, it stands for, the first A is alpha-1 adrenergic blockers. The second A would be for angiotensin converting enzymes or ACE inhibitors. And the third one is for antiarrhythmic agents. So again, we're talking about alpha-1 adrenergic blockers. The second one is angiotensin converting enzymes or ACE inhibitors. And the third one is for antiarrhythmic agents. So let's start with the alpha-1 adrenergic blocker. Okay, so as the name implies, the drug basically works by blocking the alpha-1 receptor in the vascular smooth muscle. And when this happens, it prevents the uptake of uh, what we call the catecholamines in smooth muscle cells. And basically, we need to know that all we need to know is that it, this causes vasodilation, right? And it allows blood to flow more easily in the vessels. So there are two main purposes or uses for this drug, okay? Obviously, the first one would be to treat high blood pressure or hypertension. Right? And the second one is to treat benign prostatic hyperplasia, or what we call enlarged prostate gland. With all that in mind, now we know that alpha blockers can lower the blood pressure. Right, So if we give too much of this drug, an adverse reaction or a side effect could be that we may lower the blood pressure to a very great extent that can cause hypotension. Right, And so that would be the side effect for this drug. And with hypotension, it can also lead with hypotension, it can lead to dizziness, right? Lightheadedness, it can cause heart palpitations, and also fainting. So we have to be careful when we give out um, alpha adrenergic blockers. Now, since we know that it causes hypotension, then we could analyze, understand that we need to be careful and to make sure that this drug doesn't interact with other antihypertensives or vasodilators because it could eventually cause farther hypotension or severe hypotension on the patient. One of the most important alpha-1 adrenergic blocker that you might or will encounter in the NCLEX exam is prazosin, okay, or minipress. Now let's go quickly to the next two A's, which involves angiotensin converting enzymes or ACE inhibitors and the antiarrhythmic agents. So what is an ACE inhibitor? An ACE inhibitor is used primarily to treat hypertension, although it can also be used for cardiac failure and other renal diseases. Now let's look at the pharmacokinetics of, a, of an ACE inhibitor. Obviously, we all know that ACE stands for angiotensin converting enzymes, right? And basically, an angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor reduces the activity of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, okay? Now how this works is that it's able to alter the blood pressure mechanism through the renin angiotensin system by blocking the conversion of angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. And if we go way back to our anatomy and physiology, we all know that angiotensin 2 causes vasoconstriction, which means narrowing of the blood vessels. And this narrowing of the blood vessels and the vascular smooth muscle causes an increase in blood pressure. 
and hypertension. Therefore, if we decrease the production of angiotensin II, it could eventually lead to the opposite effect, which means a decrease in blood pressure. The common adverse reactions for this group of medication would include, obviously, hypotension. And with hypotension, it can lead to headaches, dizziness, fatigue, nausea, and vomiting. And take note that a persistent dry coughing or cough is also a common adverse reaction in regards to patient that takes ACE inhibitors. And it's been, it has been associated with um, the increase in what they call the Brady kinin levels. Now, we, we don't have to go deeper into that, but it causes the persistent dry cough. And patients who do experience this coughing are often usually switched to an angiotensin II receptor antagonist. Okay. Now, another adverse reaction for ACE inhibitor is it causes hyperkalemia. And this is due to the suppression of angiotensin II which leads to a decrease in the aldosterone levels in the kidneys, right? Now, since aldosterone is responsible for increasing the excretion of potassium, um, the, the suppression of angiotensin II therefore then decreases aldosterone levels, and therefore, ACE inhibitors can cause retention of potassium, which hence would then cause hyperkalemia in the body. Now, ACE inhibitors usually would have the suffix pril or P-R-I-L, at the end of each medication. And the most common medications that you might and will encounter in the NCLEX exam would include lisinopril, which is Prenivil, Captopril, which is Capitin, Inalapril, which is Vasotec, and Kinapril, which is Acupril. Now let's look at the last category of the three A's, which is antiarrhythmic drugs. Now, the ultimate goal of an antiarrhythmic drug is basically just to restore normal rhythm and conduction, okay? And it can do this by decreasing or increasing conduction velocity. It could also alter the excitability of the cardiac cells, right? And it can also suppress abnormal automaticity. All of that basically means that an antiarrhythmic drug can directly or indirectly um, alter the, the membrane and the action potential in the cardiac muscle and basically prevent um, any possible lethal arrhythmias. Now antiarrhythmic drugs are also being broken down into different classes. Okay, Now class 1 involves sodium channel blockers, class 2 involves beta blockers, class 3 involves potassium channel blockers, and class 4 involves calcium channel blockers. Okay. Now, separate from those categories are drugs that don't belong in any of those categories, such as adenosine, um, digitalis, which is a compound, which is a cardiac glycoside, right? And atropine, which is a muscarinic receptor antagonist. 